every nation and here I will lift my voice in God bless you, God bless you. Welcome to the Hour of Deliverance. And definitely, definitely email somebody, call somebody, text somebody. Get them to join you now in the Hour of Deliverance. I'm Dr. K.E. Holmes. We are looking at the book of Jude. One of the things that I want to let you know is that as we go through the book of Jude, we are going to see that we are living in these kinds of times, the times that Enoch wrote about, the times of... of um, what it was like before the flood, the times of what it was like just before Sodom and Gomorrah, the times of what it was like when that Levite went to get his uh, concubine that had played the whore, whore with him and uh, or against him, the scripture says. And, and he went to go get her and what he experienced in Benjamin. Why am I bringing that up? Because we're going to look at these things. We're going to see where hearts are. The hearts of the body of Christ, the people of God, the hearts of the world, the hearts of the political arena, the hearts of the social arena, the hearts of the educational arena. You think you recognize that there's chaos? Yeah, there's chaos. God's got answers. He's also got positioning. And he also has his eternal purpose. Where are you? Where am I? Where are we? Okay, so let's look at this, the book of Jude. I'm going to try to, I thought I was going to go through it all in one chapter. Voila, what was I thinking? I mean, it is one chapter, but I mean all in one program. And we only got to verse 4, and I want to recap that because there's something very important, pardon me, uh, in verse 4 that lets you know where we are for the whole rest of the thing. If you don't get anything else, you want to get this out of verse 4 and I'm using amplified so that it makes it unmistakably plain so let me just read Jude a servant of Jesus Christ the Messiah the brother of James writes this letter to those who are called chosen dearly loved by God the Father and separated that is set apart and kept for Jesus Christ. Now, in the last, in the previous week, I reminded us that right here we see that this business of positioning. So many uh, people in the church today want to have position. It is not wrong to want to have position. Please understand that. When you look at Isaiah sixty-one, doing the work of Messiah, people have position. And it is of God that people will call you the ministers of the Lord. People are going to give you titles because people recognize with appreciation that you're doing a move of God or you're doing a necessary thing. Everybody's not going to recognize that it's God when you're in, when everybody doesn't know God, but everybody does recognize that it's something necessary and something ought to be appreciated. And the work of Messiah, when you go into that chapter, you find that, yes, it's winning souls, but it's also getting some social things done, some practical things done. There's also some some uh, tearing down and some building up. So that, for instance, if you're in real estate and you're a saint of the Lord, you're one of God's people, you do real estate differently than other people. And you have compassion. And you follow God's law and God's precepts, regardless of whether... Uh, 
a, a practice is what everybody does or what the bank does or doesn't allow. Now some of the other things in that first chapter you see that it's Jude. Here we go. The brother, he's actually the brother of the Lord Jesus, but he's not putting himself up with that, with him. We're living in a day and time when it's, it, it lets you know it's a different kind of heart if someone doesn't have opportunity to let you know their place and position and they don't do it. He makes himself the brother of James because he knows that James and, and, and I are fully man, but not God at all. And the, he recognized, took him a while, but he recognized that Jesus, fully man, was also and is also fully God. So he doesn't make himself the brother of. He could because both are born of Mary. So on a technicality, yeah, he could. And that also helps you know that this whole business of the mother of God, that doesn't work. According to scripture, to put it in today's vernacular, that doesn't fly. That doesn't, no, that doesn't go that way. But uh, just to let you know that these things are backed up in the scripture, but it's where we are today. That people want recognition and people want esteem. And please understand, it's not wrong. But when we're asking what's wrong with it, we're in the wrong position. We're in the wrong plane. We have the wrong priority. That's for sure. Because God says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. The thing of it is, when God exalts you, you've gone through. You've been tried. And I don't mean drug through. I'm talking about you've gone through with integrity. And you've gone through things that don't make sense, shouldn't happen. But you've kept God's integrity as your own integrity. So that when you're exalted... You still know how to be servant of servants, even though you may be top dog, head boss, and all of that. Well, I want to move on, so because I, I want to, to finish. But the second verse, may mercy, that is soul peace, not this business of I'm keeping the peace, so I'm going to keep quiet. No, no, that's false, false flesh. Soul peace, may, may mercy, soul peace, and love be multiplied to you. Notice it's not enough just to have love, but it's got to be multiplied. And it's not this, um, I excuse everything kind of walk. That's not what love is, because love walks in truth. So love doesn't uphold something uh, just to do this false thing of keeping the peace. No, the peace of God rules. He is Prince of Peace, and he is also God of Peace. So he rules and moves in truth. He doesn't just let something go in order to keep from an argument. He knows how to move and and handle things without, uh, handle opposition even, without getting engaged into an argument. Now he, you might, the person that you're talking to, they might, might, they might want to argue. The group that you're talking to, they might get disgruntled. I remember when my son was, um, uh, in American Idol season four, and Simon, who was a, a judge at the time, he uh, made a, some kind of statement that his kindness was false. He he looked at it as a, this falseness that to him Americans uh, come across with, and not realizing that this is genuine in this young man. Yes, there is falseness. There's people that put on a pretense. But this particular young man, he is genuinely that kind to the point that he got out of line to help help a lady because that's what his father taught him and that's how he is, that you help a lady with her bags and you do this. Getting out of line could have put him all the way back at the end of that. I think that line was something like 2,000 people at all vying for American Idol. And he made it to California. He, you know... Because God blesses you. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due time. And understand that the first two commandments need to always be in the forefront of your mind, of your sight, of your vision, of your actions, your doing, your heart, your feeling. And what are they? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your might. That is with everything, everything that you are. 
and love the second one is love your brother as yourself so that whatever situation you're in we're living in this earth horizontally and so we're living in relation to our brother and so we always want to live in relation to loving our brother not just loving our program our time schedule what we're about and what we have to do because that puts our attention on us and the second commandment lets you know that your attention is on your brother it's not on you you love yourself but you're not smelling yourself you're not thinking of yourself at every point and every turn and what happens with that is God blesses you because you are moving in the things you're supposed to move in. When you love your brother, you have bowels of compassion. When you love your brother, you're your brother's keeper. When you love your brother, you automatically move in the things of God being El Roy, that you know what to do and you have uh, the, the means wherewith to do what you, you need to do. If you need to be a billionaire because you're running into people that are going to need your services and need your heart, God will make you a billionaire. Remember, it is the Lord thy God that giveth, giveth thee. He's given you power to get wealth. It's to establish his covenant. What's his covenant? His covenant with man is I'll love you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. His covenant is whatever you say, I, I will back it up. And... God will put you in position for whatever it is. Every priest, you were a royal priesthood. Every priest that God puts in position, he equips with what you're supposed to do. The priests that are supposed to carry the water, he makes sure they're strong and not feeble. The priest that is supposed to make intercede for the people, now all priests are, but especially the high priest, he makes sure that you, that prayer is just part of what you automatically do. Nobody has to knock on your door and see if you woke up in the morning. You're already up and you're already moving in the things of God. Nobody has to entice you to worship because when you want to move into prayer and you're going before God, praise is automatic. Nobody has to get you geared up and reared up to do it. You see, God equips you for who you are and what he's given you. And it just happens that it's going to bless you too. It's going to bless God. You're going to bless God vertically. You're going to bless your brother horizontally. And you are going to move in an overflow of what it all is just because you're equipped. Okay, we're going to look at this Jude when we come back. particularly looking at it in Amplified to make it easy to understand what God is saying. Because we live in a time when we're trying to uh, be okay with the social and be okay with the Word of God, and it just doesn't work. And so we trip up on it. 
or we're busy being mad at what's going on socially and we'll trip up on it because our anger is in the way of truth. That's how you make the tradition, your tradition, uh, make the word of God of no effect. None of us who are righteous have the intention of disrespecting God's word. But when you let your indignation and your anger get in the way of making God's word plain and clear, you're going to trip all over it and trip other people up as well. And so second, uh, we're going to look at the second verse. Uh, may, well, we saw mercy and peace it and love multiplied to you. So you're not just to have it, but you're also supposed to multiply it. And the worst times are the more that needs to be exponentiated. And that word multiplied more has to do with exponentiation. Uh, it has the way that it increases, kind of like mushrooms overnight. And we're going to see in these coming months, we're going to see things changing every day overnight, sometimes so fast that you won't have noticed, except for that you'll see it in the supermarket because it's the economics. It's going to be hit really hard. And you're going to see it in the way that people act. We thought we saw something with road rage. You're about to see some other things unloosed, and I'm going to show it to you right here. So... He's letting you know ahead of time. And please know that's God's principle. That ahead of time, he prepares you. Ahead of time, he equips you. He doesn't wait till the calamities come and then place in you the tools that you need. The weapons of our warfare are mighty through God. And they are strong. They are strong. They pull down strongholds. And anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. But God doesn't wait till the last minute to give it to you. I know that we kind of like that song that that uh, he may not come when you want him, but he's right on time. Listen, God is already there. He is already there. All you have to do is, is like, like the servant was told, is to lift up your eyes and look. And you're going to see that there's more with you than than are against you. You, If you open your eyes to the Lord and to his truth and to his way, rather than your circumstance and your situation, if you look at the storm like Peter did when he was already out walking on water, he stopped looking at Jesus and he looked at the storm. And what happened? He began to sink. I'm telling you, beloved, that we're come, we are in for a whirlwind time of judgment. Don't be so busy knowing it's judgment that you take your eyes off of Jesus and look at the storm or you'll be taken under. You'll be saved, taken under. And by the way, saved, if you are not saved and you're watching this program right now, give yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ. Ask Jesus to come into your heart. Ask him to come into your life. Ask him to, to refresh you, to renew you, to to bring you to Jesus Christ. Ask him to be your Lord and your Savior. Confess that he, born of a virgin, died on the cross from your sins and rose from the dead. When you've done this, if you have done it sincerely, confess this thing with your mouth. Set it out loud because the courts of earth and the courts of heaven are listening and witnessing. That's why you want to say it out loud. Then what happens is that the spirit of the Lord, way faster than what I can say it or even motion it, but the spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, he baptizes you into the body of Christ. That's what it's talking about. One Lord, one baptism, one Lord, one faith, one baptism for the faith that you just confessed when you asked Jesus to be your Lord and savior. When you confess that he is the only son of God, that faith puts you in position, it puts you in the birth canal, and the Holy Ghost baptizes you into the body of Christ. That's not the infilling, that's not the baptism of the Holy Ghost, that is the Holy Ghost baptizing you. You know that you can only be born, and and he's telling you that you're born of water and of spirit, but once you're born, we know the principle that you can't be unborn, you cannot Go back into the birth canal and do this thing over again. There's a whole lot of things that happen. It doesn't mean you can't die. I know that we have all these doctrines around what can and can't happen. But I want you to understand he's saying that the, the peace is multiplied to you. It is not a false peace. It's the real peace of God. And all of this washing of the water of the word happens over your soul and over your mind. All of this, this blood that Jesus shed, it cleanses your sin and your sin nature that you couldn't do to make it so that you can walk in the newness of life. 
so that you have this love that his commandments are not hard. They're not grievous. He, Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. That's what all this love has to do with. It has to do with being able to move in truth. We're used to GPS in this day and time. His love navigates you through the days and the time. Yes, it's a path and his path is straight, but walking it out in this earth, sometimes just like when you're on a road driving somewhere and a road is broken up by a plot of land, a road is broken up by a mountain. You've got to walk through these things in this earth and his love makes it so that you can follow the spirit because remember, he's the one that baptized you into the body of Christ. He's the one that raises you in the newness of life. That same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead is powerful enough to live in you and walk in you so that you can do these things and understand these things that are in this book so that's just verse two so let's look at verse three okay beloved he wants you to know that you're loved some of you have been all dejected and rejected and some of you major in it for yourself when nobody's doing it to you but he wants you to know you're beloved get off of that thing you don't need a psychiatrist you need the word you're the beloved you're the beloved let the word counsel you you're the beloved End of story. You're the beloved. Beginning and end of story. The Alpha and Omega, Omega loves you. So he says, my whole concern was to write to you in regard in to our common salvation. So you don't you you might have a new word that's new to you, but it's our common salvation. Jesus Christ, born of a virgin. Jesus Christ, son of the living God, fully God, fully man. Jesus Christ walking the earth as a man so that you can know how and as God so that he could save our soul, your soul, my soul, whoever will call on him. God had already placed that thing. He died on the cross. He was beaten so that you'd be healed. He was beaten so that your mind would be healed. You don't have to have mental illness and mental uh, problems so that your soul would be healed. Your psyche doesn't have to be all messed up. And so, so that everything about you is saved, is washed, is, 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 uh, comes through the healing that is in his body being beaten for you. His blood was shed to wash you from your sin. His body was beaten so that you have complete, total, and whole healing. That's your mind, your body, your soul. Okay. So that, yes, you had things happen in your life. Well, they don't take over because now you have a new life. As a matter of fact, the way he said, beloved, in another scripture, he says, behold. He says, all things are passed away. All that other thing is dead, died, gone. Stop digging it up. You know that when, stop digging it up. So he says here, walk in the newness of life. He says, behold, all things have become new. That's what you want to behold. So he said, I found it necessary. And and was impelled to write to you and urgently appeal and to exhort you. And I'm finding it necessary in these times that we're living in to appeal to you and to exhort you to contend for the faith. Don't flake out and don't anger out. Don't get all full of indignation. And you know that you are when you're fighting with your brother and your sister over the issues. When you're fighting with other people in the kingdom over the social issues. No, we need to come together. We need to come together and hear what thus saith the Lord to know what we are to do. And then we need to empower everyone to do the direction of the Lord. We're taking too much time and discussion and disgruntledness. And it's a mess. It's a problem. It is. But God is the answer. He has the answer. And his people are the ones who can do anything about it. And if we're busy arguing, if we're busy making arguments, and not coming with his solutions, then we are part of the problem. Because the problem continues. The whole earth groans. It's waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. That's you. That's me. The earth needs the manifestation of us to stop the mess. And to, to move the earth into the blessing of God. Anyway, so here we go. So I, it's, I, I find this urgency. James uh, Jude said it at that time. It was urgent then, and it is even more urgent now. And he says, this faith that was once and for all handed down to the saints, the faith which is the sum of Christian belief. Do you understand this? 
It's not this mixed in and that mixed in, which was delivered verbally to the holy people of God. Now watch this. For certain men have crept in stealthily. They've snuck all in, gaining entrance secretly by a side do door. Now watch, their doom was predicated. This is already a doom situation. When people come in your church and they come with a, a, a smile, doing one thing and, and <laughs> saying one thing and doing another, smiling at you, but their actions aren't a smile at all, their actions are not grace, watch that that's what he's talking about stealthily they sneak in and they get by on your heart it happened uh when with joshua when the when the children of israel were to they were to annihilate everything that was around because it exalted itself all against the knowledge of god and they were to annihilate but here came somebody uh they they made up a plan they put old cheese and old bread in, in their sacks and they pretended like they were from some from a further away they came in and they fooled the man of God. So we always have to stay before God. Just because you're a man of God, just because you've been walking with God longer than Methuselah, doesn't make it so that you don't have to seek God. You have to seek him on every situation and every person, especially the one smiling at you. The one smiling at you who is right and real, God will show you how to move them into place and how you can be part of God exalting them in due time, not keeping them under so that they can stay with you because they're such a blessing to you. No, they're a blessing to the kingdom. And the one that smiles at you, that they're like those ones that brought that old bread and that old cheese in order to, to get in covenant to have what they wanted to have. People that want to have what they want to have, whether they're outside of the kingdom or to inside of the kingdom. People that are concerned about themselves are not concerned about you and they are not concerned about God. And it will cause what they do, even if they're sincere about what they do, because they're sincerely strong about themselves, it'll cause what they do to not have right fruit. But you don't want to wait till you get to the fruit to know that. You want to be following God through the Holy Spirit, through his word, so that you can walk this thing out. Remember, he's your GPS. The word of God is your navigation through this earth and through the walk that you are ordained to. So he says, uh, certain men, they crept in and they, they fooled you. And he says, they're impious and they're profane. They don't want to respect anything but themselves. And then some of them are just downright profane that you can't make a mistake. And most of us, when we're loving God, we, we, we look, we hear the profane. We know it doesn't go with that, which is, is pious. We know the two don't go together. And so we try to act like we didn't see it. We either act like we didn't see the pious because we heard the profane so loud, or we act like we didn't hear the profane because we see the pious is real. Listen, God has called people into place and everybody doesn't walk it like they should. God counts what you do in faith as faith. But those that other mess that you do, you need to take it before God. But before God takes it up with you. So, because it causes you to mess over his people and God doesn't like it. So he says, these people, they crept in, they did this, and who pervert the grace of the spiritual blessing and favor. They are messing with your grace. They pervert the favor that you have with God and they mess this thing up. Now watch, this is important because this is what we are living. Ah, I need to put my glasses back on. I have the eyes of Moses and the strength of Caleb according to the very word of God from beginning of life to end of life. And it says, um, the scripture says here that into lawlessness. That's number one. We've already seen the unleashing of lawlessness in our times through road rage on social in social issues. Uh, we've seen it, uh, the lawlessness in our educational system, making laws that are not of God, the lawlessness that the police are perpetrating on the people, that the courts are perpetrating on the people. Lawlessness, that is the first thing. We're so busy looking at the immorality because, frankly, that's one of the things that the, the apostles told us in the early church when it was Gentiles be coming into the Lord and non-Jews coming to, the, to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And then what shall we do? Well, don't uh, eat things sacrificed to idols and don't fornicate. There's so much that covers so much. 
But they said, no, you, you can't turn around to be a Jew. It's the blood of Jesus that has washed you. And it's Jesus who has saved you, not the laws and the customs. You need to know them and you need to be able to walk in them. And I'm not talking about Levitical law. I'm talking about the law of God before there was a Levitical law. And so he says that they go into lawlessness and then watch. That's the first thing. And then after that is wantonness. Anything I want is all right. Anything I need to do is all right. Anything I call myself is all right. And that's where we are now with the identity crisis, with the gender crisis. First, it's lawlessness on every plane, in the courtroom, in the classroom, on the playground. In your workplace, lawlessness, people aren't adhering to the rules, whether they're right rules or wrong rules. There's lawlessness, but after that is immorality and, and it's unleashed. And we're going to show you, we're going to show you that progression and it's unreasonable against the knowledge of God. So like the times of Sodom and Gomorrah, so like the times of Enoch, so like the times of the flood. And we need to know how to do, not just what's going on, but what to do. So here we see that certain men, they crept in uh, among you, pretending to be like you or, or having something to do with you. They crept in and they their, their doom was predicted long ago. So it's only doom. That's only what they're coming to. You don't have to wait and see. You already know because the word told you. And then he says that they're impious. That's one of the things that you, helps it to for you to recognize. They don't respect the things of God. They don't respect even traditional things. They have no, they do not respect. And usually it's a belittling intellectually. It's a belittling uh, um, making themselves like this, that just doesn't make sense. Or, uh, 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 it's an attitude and a disposition that causes this impiety. They make themselves of a position which makes you feel that you're subordinate, uh, whether it's individually, whether it's a group, whether it's a, a um, uh, organization, it's impious. And then it's also profane. Does not not show you the Antichrist? We all know that the Antichrist at first he comes saying peace and the first uh, three years of the tribulation it looks all like peace. And then three and a half years in he turns around <coughs> and he does the abomination of desolation. This is the devil. You need to know. You don't have to wait to get there to find out. When it's when it's impious, no respect, can't respect God. That was what was how Lucifer fell. He was smelling his own stuff, listening to his own songs. Well, God is the one who gave him the tabrets that he could sing like that, that he could bring the music like that. And he saw how he could, he was the only one of his kind. He was the anointed uh, cherub that covered the throne. Now it takes two cherubs. He knew that he was something. He was the son of the morning. 
He didn't know that there was going to be a bright and morning star. And when he saw that there's something brighter than him, he didn't like it because he's concerned about himself. And he got impious uh, toward God. He couldn't respect and fear God. That's what impiety is. When people don't have respect for the things of God, you might think they don't respect you. They're not respecting God. God told that to Ezekiel. I'm sending you to a people. They're not going to listen. Why? Because they're not listening to me. They won't hear you because they won't hear me. God told that to Moses. It's not that they're so mad at you. Yes, they're mad at you and they're taking it out on you, but that's because they're not hearing me. So understand that impiety, while living it out, it is as if someone's against you. What they are is against God. So please understand, they crucified your Savior. Yeah, they'll crucify you too. Naming the name of Christ, naming the name of God, saying they're doing it in the name of God, saying they're doing it in the name of, of the law. Stop in the name of the law. But that's where I want you to see and understand the pattern. The first thing of this pattern there's impending doom. God's told you the end before the beginning. There is doom. Now, how you how it unfolds in the generations, how it folds in the nations, how it folds in your family, here's the pattern so that you can recognize it. You don't have to live out your whole life and, and see. It's cert, first, it's lawlessness when your children don't want to listen. The scriptures tell us in, in a few different places that we're living in a time when it's going to be like that, that the children will turn it on their parents. And now today we have children turning parents into children and youth. God didn't give children and youth to raise your parents. I'm um, pardon me, to raise your children. He gave you to do it. And some of you are bringing your hands. I don't know what to do. Well, wisdom teaches you what to do. Most of the time when we think we don't know what to do, it's because what to do is, is a difficult thing. It's hard. It's hard to kick up against the pricks, though. It's hard to go against the word of God. And when we want to save this, that God says, you don't save that. You know, if something's rotten and something's spoiled, you get rid of it. You don't save it. I know some people that <laughs> they'll put something in the refrigerator and put something away until it stinks. God's not telling you don't have to wait. You know that it's going to stink. If it's spoiled, it's going to stink. If your children are spoiled, if your nation, if things have gone awry, it's going to stink. So he says, now the pattern I want you to get, and I know that I gave this to you before, but because of the complacency that happens in these times, he already said, I implore you. You already know this, but I have to, I have to implore you. I have to plead with you and I have to knead it back into you. You've all, you already know these things. And yet I have to keep saying it so till you get it, saying it till you have strength to stand up in it, with it, for it, through it. And I'm the, it being the word of God. And so he says, now watch the pattern, watch the pattern. He says, now they're trading your grace. You're saved, but they're trading your grace for lawlessness. Now we explained that one already. And then wantonness. I want what I want. I got to have what I got to have. I made out a plan and this needs to be followed. I, 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 whether it's, um, denomination, well, we did it this way and we want it that way. And so we're going to take the property if you don't want to stand for this. And if you don't want to take down to that. Now, <clears throat> it doesn't matter that you and your, your area and your congregation built this thing up over the years. That doesn't matter. Wantonness is, this is what I want. This is my rules and this is what I want and what we're going to do. And so they step in. But you see, the first thing is lawlessness. The second thing is wantonness. Has not to do with the things of God. It has to do with, listen, I say what goes on around here. It has to do with this is what I want. And that's whether it's on an individual scale, whether it's in the educational arena, whether it's in the spiritual arena, it's whether it's in the political arena, it's whether it's in your house, in your nation, in your state, in your city. This is the pattern. Now, lawlessness in your house looks like your, your husband doesn't want to listen to the wife. Wife doesn't want to listen to the husband. Children aren't listening to anybody. That's lawlessness, lawlessness in your house. Your dog doesn't even want to listen to you. 
And then lawlessness in, in the city is when crimes occur when, oh, this was a sleepy town. This was a quiet town. That kind of never happened. Lawlessness is when you have these, um, and I'm sorry to tell you these things. I am. But you need to know. You need to know so that you know how to position yourself to either bring it down. The weapons of our warfare are mighty. They're strong through God. And they pull down strongholds. Did you hear me? Strong holds. Our weapons are mighty through God and pull that stuff down. If we're in position, if we're using our weapons and our tools, but you need to know. So I'm sorry to tell you this, but I want you to understand that this lawlessness, what happens is that the person that you would never suspect is the person that rapes. The person that you would just never is the person that murders, not just the one you expect, the one who's, who's ugly all day long and only ever been a problem. Yeah, they're doing their lawlessness. But when lawlessness prevails over this stuff here, over moving away from the things of God and being impious and without respect, then it comes from places that you don't expect. But now you know, and when you have this unction from the Holy Ghost, don't pretend like you don't know because who would believe such a thing? When you move into lawlessness, the thing that's unreasonable becomes the norm. It begins to happen. And so <clears throat> then he said, so after the lawlessness, watch, it's the wantonness. All of a sudden, people who knew how I can't just do everything I see on television. No, now they're figuring it out and they're going to do it and they're planning it. And you wouldn't suspect. Some of them you would. And you can do something about it. But some of them you wouldn't, and it takes you by surprise if you're not paying attention to the word through the spirit of God. And so after the wantonness, wantonness in, in, your, in your nation looks like laws that have nothing to do with the precepts and principles of God. And they, it, it, it's in your courtroom. It has to do with laws that don't adhere to the very laws that are on the books. But it favors a people. We had that happen in, in the New Testament church, remember? When some, uh, they said that the, the Egyptian, pardon me, the Grecian women weren't getting treated the same way. When this creeps in so that, oh, well, I'm going to give them a little bit extra because that's my family. Or because that's my ace. Or because that's my anything. Wantonness is what that is. And it is against the knowledge of God. So those of us who will want to move with the weapons of our warfare will bring it down. And when we bring it down, we're not destroying everything in sight. Well, okay, here we go. So there's the lawlessness and then there's the wantonness. And then he says, in morality, there is, it's kind of like, uh, there's nothing that's wrong anymore. Everything goes. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. But in society, in your house, in your city, in your nation, in your courts, in your classroom, that's how it becomes. Whether it's your elementary school, your middle school, your high school, or the colleges. That's how, <clears throat> that's how it goes. And God wants you to know. And then he's going to let you say it again so that you get the seriousness of this. And he wants you to know that this, all of this... Uh, gets you to it causes you to be in a place that you disown or deny our soul master. You take on all these other masters, don't realizing you're taking on God's. It gets you to deny our soul master and Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. And because it happens gradually, you're making excuses as to why, and you're including things that God said no. He said Nick's nay before you even started. And now we want to include these things until they take over. Kind of like weeds in your garden, you know? And so he says, <clears throat> now, this is verse 5. I want to remind you. He's already said, I implore you. I impeach you. You already knew some things. I'm going to remind you. Now he's telling you again. I'm telling you again. I'm giving you the word again. In verse 5, I want to remind you. I want to to remind you. And this is God talking here. Uh, God wants to remind you. This is his word. He says, 
though you were fully informed, and some of some of us, the part of the problem is we know that we knew it. We know that we knew it all. And I don't mean all of everything. I'm talking about we know we knew all about this thing. I want to get there where I know all about anything. All I know is that I need to seek God at all times. When I look at the word, I see that even the most anointed, most appointed get nuts when they don't don't seek the Lord. I was telling them in church, in church that David ran to the Philistines. Uh, Elijah ran to uh, Jezebel's hometown. You know, people of God who are appointed, anointed of God, who God has a testimony in at the point they're not seeking God, do some crazy things. And some squirrely things. We need to always seek him. Not be so so grounded in our walk with God. And no matter how glorious it has been. No matter how wonderful it has been. And God is so busy being God in you, through you, and for you. You still need to seek him to get it right. The minute you don't, you'll be like the king who messed up right away. It won't be over time. It'll be right away. So he says right here. That now I want to remind you, though you were fully informed, and and the, the, that through the Lord at one time delivered a people out of Egypt, he subsequently destroyed those of them who did not believe, who refused to adhere to and to trust in and rely upon him. Do you get that? You have to, you have to trust. You have to rely. You have to seek him. If you're missing out on any one of that, you're messing with your grace. We're looking at, at Jude, the book of Jude. It's only one chapter, but my, is that thing heavy. And I want you to understand, too, when God talks about how the, these men sneak in, and, and this will be women as well. Usually the women come in uh, with a seducing spirit, and the men come in with a tricking spirit. And when you find in your life, I'm going to talk to the individual, I'm going to talk to the, to the nation, listen, and individually, when you find in your life that you're, you're dealing with people who are slick, people of God, but they're people who are slick, that they said this and they didn't tell you that. You know, they, they told you half the story, didn't tell you the whole story. Or they, and, and they'll tell you later, well, it changed after I told you such and so and so, but we can still go. We can still do this. We can still get on with that. When you find that that's happening in your individual life, that is letting you know that you need to seek the Lord as to what and how to be navigated by the Holy Spirit. Because you're definitely dealing with it. And everybody's going to deal with it, but to a different degree. But I promise you, to any one of you, the degree that you deal with it is 100% for you. You might, someone else might deal with it much more severe than you do, but each one of us, we walk our walk to the fullest of our ability because God is wanting to bless us to the fullest of our storehouse, the fullest of our heart, but all hearts aren't the same. 
Some, some have enlarged their territory. Others have a small spirit. And, and this, by the way, the scripture calls that mean-spirited. If you keep yourself small, you'll be mean. You'll be miserly. And you will find yourself not walking with God because you're so busy in your wantonness. And you won't recognize it as wantonness, but you're just protecting your stuff. Listen, God is the one who protects your stuff. Some of you have heard my testimony about posting the host because they're appointed to watch over you and everything that belongs to you. Psalm 91, won't go to it now because we're in Jude. But I want you to go through the book of Jude. It's only one chapter and see how many times it almost be like a broken record when you don't like it. And when you don't like it, you're probably already in the situation on the wrong side of it. But he tells you over and over and over again in different words. And you want to count how many times because it'll have to do with something of the numbers of, of the number of God. But how many times did he tell you that they don't respect and I'll use the word respect, but he'll talk about revile. He'll talk about rebuff. He'll, he'll talk about the wantonness. All of this is not respect. And he keeps saying it over because it's a problem. And maybe you'll make an excuse for it that way, or maybe you won't recognize it this way. Maybe you're so busy doing running for the Lord and not being distracted that you don't recognize what's going on around you, that this has happened. You need to move in the Lord with the love that you have for him so that nothing is sneaking in on you. But guess what? The second commandment is that you love your brother as yourself. If you're head of a church and your church has got it all right and all going on, you want to help the other church. Not have the wantonness, and I'm just kind of giving you a clue here to know that it's wantonness, that all you're about is just your church and just your work and just what you're doing. You have that example in the seven churches. And at the end of each church, the seven churches in the book of Revelation, at the end of each one, the Holy Spirit says, the word of God says, that's two witnesses right there to let you know this thing is true. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church as, not just what's going on in yours. We're in a time and in a place where, yes, you need to be about what God's given you to do. You need to be about your father's business. And it needs to be what Jesus said about himself that needs to be for you when he said my meat what i live on what i live for what i live through what i live by is to do the will of him that sent me and to complete his work but understand the first commandment is love the lord your god with all your heart soul mind and strength the second commandment is just like it in other words all your heart and soul mind and strength love your neighbor as yourself if you're if it's your household you need to see to your neighbor how many people would we're going through the summer now. How many people die in the heat? Now, we haven't had that kind of heat this year. Uh, but every year it happens because nobody looked in on them. Maybe their family wasn't looking in on them, but they're your neighbor. And you're sitting watching the, the ambulance come and bring somebody out. Why? We must, are we our brother's keeper? Yes, we are. The second commandment before God that we need to put our energy into it. Not this business of mind my business. That's that same thing of am I my brother's keeper? And he keeps telling you here there's this disrespect for the things of God. And then he tells you that there's this, this immorality and this wantonness that I'm going to do what I want to do. And some of you, you find yourself in private doing things that you know that you have no business. Listen, Job said it. I've made a covenant with my eyes. I told you that before. I'm going to keep telling you. Just like he said, I implore you. And I need to remind you. Because these are the times we live in. These are the times that you have to live through and come out righteous. Come out smelling a sweet, smelling like a sweet smelling savor to the Lord and not a stink. Coming out to be someone who intercedes and who is a voice for those with no voice. Rather than let unrighteous no unrighteousness go on because it's none of your business because you don't know that you're your brother's keeper i'm reminding you of the word i'm imploring you because the times that we're in and it's about to get so bad and i'm not talking about the tribulation i'm talking about it's about to get bad right here in the united states and it's going to affect the entire world you need to know these things and you need to know are you going to be uh like joseph and have prepared and prepared a way for your family and have prepared a way for the people that don't even know God. Just because God has given you, has God put things in your heart that you want that to do 
and you don't know why and they don't make sense and you already have enough to do with your job and your ministry and your this and your that. Don't move into wantonness. Do the thing that keeps coming to your heart because God, remember, he prepares you ahead of time. And there is a doom, just like he told you in the first part of, the, of this book. He told you there's a certain doom. I'm looking at Amplified. A certain doom. It is certain and it's doom. And, and just like the dream that the Pharaoh had that Joseph interpreted, there, it is certain that it's going to be this way, then it's going to be that way, and it's going to be so bad that nobody's even going to remember the good or the bad. They're just going to be busy with what it is now. And please understand, you don't wait for the government to help you. You call on God. The government's idea of what help is, is not God's idea. And the government's idea of what help is, is not enough. It keeps you in bondage. And God wants you set free. He doesn't just want you saved and free in your soul. He wants that. But part of that package with God is that you're free in your life. You're free in your walk. That you're free in your mind. That you're not so overwhelmed and encumbered by the doom that you don't know what to do. But you walk in wisdom. And I'm always telling you in Ecclesiastes 10.10, 10, wisdom is profitable to direct. The first part of that verse, it tells you, if you don't wet the axe, God's telling you, if you don't sharpen your axe, you're going to have to take more strength. And the doom takes away your strength. So God is sharpening our axes now and he's warning us again and again and again and again. I'm letting you know the pattern is lawlessness and wantonness and immorality. Don't be surprised at it. Have the answer for it. I love that our brother Andre Crouch that passed on, he, said, he gave that song that Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer and he is the answer and he has the answer and he's giving it to you. You're to be in this world even as he. You're to have the answers for the dilemmas, not just recognize the problem, not just know all what the judgment is. Because remember, you're walking this earth at this time. You will be, you will receive part of the judgment, not having done what we're to do. Remember that Roman scripture that I gave you, that Romans 8? The whole earth groans, waiting for the manifestation of you. It says the sons of God, so it needs to be all of us. And it can't be all of us if we're fighting. It can't be all of us if we're arguing over the issues. No, we need to walk in truth. And we need to respect. That is honor. That is give honor. We need to remember what gratefulness is. And remember what thankfulness is. We, by, with Jude, we've already had uh, singing in your heart, making melody unto the Lord. Now we make our melody unto one another. How good did I do it? How, did I get the harmonies right? Did I get the, the, the get, did I get that key, note correct? Did I get that run? Ah, making melody to the Lord. These are the things that brings, bring us out. There's things you must do, but there's what you must be so that your doing has proper fruit. Please understand that. You can do the right, right thing in a wrong way and it's going to come out different. It's going to grow and it's going to grow up. But it won't be strong if you do it with, in a right heart. And I'm talking about seeking the truth, moving in love. That very, the thing that he said in the, in the second verse, after the opening, the first, he lets you know, you got to move in this love. And it's not this, I love Marilyn Hickey with the coin, the phrase she used to coin years ago, slape agape. You know, it's not that. No, it's love that ministers life. If what you're doing causes life, then it's, it's right. But if what you're doing wears you out, wears the people out, causes it so that you have to turn a blind eye to this and a blind eye to that, the scripture already tells you that if it's in your power to do, then do it. But if you have to close your eye to this because that's not my call, if you have to close your eye, if it's in front of you, just like uh, the parable where God asked, who's the neighbor? Whether it was the priest or whether it was the Levite, each one was on their way doing what they had to do. Doing The priest has things that he has to do and it's by a time. He has to be on time. So yeah, you can understand why he couldn't stop and help somebody because then he won't be in place. 
And we know that that's important. When that angel wrestled with Jacob, he had to leave to be on time. He had to leave to be in place. So yes, these things are important. But God's showing us the most important is that you love your brother as yourself. The most important. And that's what keeps us so that we have respect, so that we give honor. That's what keeps us from going into immorality and keeps us away from wantonness. All about me, all about my city, my law, my nation, my ministry. And moves us in the love of God so that we have the answer for these perilous times. In Jesus' name, let it be you. You are blessed and anointed of God. You are ablaze with the glory of God. God has blessed the work of your hands and you walk in favor with God and man. You think from the word and you make wise moves. You are blessed and excel in all that you do. You always attract people of wisdom and an excellent spirit and you engage in transactions and situations of vast, excellent and lasting merit. You are occupied with people and endeavors on a plane of timely, immediate, high and positive return in the internal, the external, and the eternal realm, in the temporal, the celestial, the natural, the spiritual, in the personal, interpersonal, community, national, and global. You move in all that pertains to life and godliness, according to the promises of God in all of their fullness. You are continuously and profoundly supplied in time, resources, wisdom, and health, in favor and finance, and all manner of wealth, in revelation and vision of things present and things to come, in the knowledge and understanding standing and zeal of the Holy One. You are called to His glory, His virtue, and His praise. You are elected to His power, His loving kindness, and His grace. You are clothed with humility, and you are prudent in matters. You are blessed and anointed, highly favored and appointed, and you are full of the Word of God and its demonstration. God has appointed your going out and your coming in. He has ordained that your very life exemplify Him. Righteousness, justice, and holiness unto the Lord is the mark of your call. And the resurrection power and the glory of God, you will fulfill all. You are blessed and anointed of God. You are ablaze with the glory of God.